financial sanctions and so on. And when uh, we are now get, going to get, when we get a democratic constitution agreed upon, then uh, the rest will be lifted, like arms and oil embargo. So we are now uh, urging a phased uh, lifting of sanctions. But uh, the idea is to ensure that sanctions remain in place, yes. in spite of those fears. Yes. Um, just one more, sir. easy one. Um, during our visit to the country here, there has been a general talk about the oil party conference, which some people seem to favor. And there is talk about an interim government or constituent assembly. assembly. What is, again, the ANC's position on this? Well, uh, we rejected uh, the multi-party conference, which was called by Declare, simply because uh, Declare is himself a belligerent. He is a man whose hands are full of, of, of blood. And uh, we cannot be called into a conference by a man who is actually responsible for the massacre of innocent people. So we rejected that. And uh, secondly, our standpoint was that uh, we have been talking to the clerk for the last 18 months about this violence. And uh, we have now presented certain demands to him, which he must meet before we can have discussions with him. And uh, those demands he has not met. And uh, the, essentially, the conference that he was calling was merely a talking shop. And, uh, all the demands were presented him could be settled by declaring himself without calling any conference, without any further talks with us. We say, for example, he must ban <coughs> dangerous weapons from being carried in public. Why must we discuss this? It's an obvious thing that weapons of death must be banned by the government. And uh, we say that uh, this chapel comes from the hostels. The hostels, they say, must be phased out and transformed into family units. Because at present, you have migrants, uh, males uh, living in these hostels. In, uh, the, in close pros proximity, and sometimes right in the center of the townships, <coughs> these are men who are totally irresponsible. They kill not only men, but women and children. And because their, their children, their own families are safe in the countryside, <coughs> We say for that reason, let the hostels be transformed uh, into family units. And why must we discuss that? Uh, we say let the police, the security services, use the same methods of crowd control when dealing with black demonstrations as they do with whites. With whites, they don't carry firearms. And uh, that is the right wing when they try to disrupt their meetings or uh, when they do something which is a threat to law and order. They don't use firearms. They just go there and deal and use the civilized methods of crowd control. But with blacks, they use live ammunition. Any demonstration by blacks, no matter how uh, disciplined such a demonstration is, is dealt with as a, as a matter of war. Now, all these things and the rest of the demands that were made don't require any discussion. And for that reason, we refuse to go there. But, and we have insisted that we will attend a conference which is summoned, which is called by an independent party. The churches have now taken that initiative. We are prepared to go. We have repealed all the apartheid, main pillars of apartheid now. The argument now goes, yes, but apartheid is still alive and well because I, Mr. Mandela, whoever speaks, I still don't have the vote. I'm not in Parliament. It's an unfair approach at this stage because we have consensus with all of them who say that, that I must not unilaterally give them the vote. That before we do so, we must have a multi-party conference. And that the way in which they will get the vote, because there is no doubt it's irreversible, they will get the vote. There will be a one-man, one-vote system in South Africa with due protection of minority rights against suppression. And minorities won't be defined on a racial basis. 
So it's unfair to say, but keep up sanctions, keep up ostracism of South Africa, as if we still have to be forced to move to a fully representative democracy. We way beyond the point of no return with regard to that. But we've also agreed with all our interlocutors on the procedure before we give that vote and before we move to a new constitution, and that is negotiation. Do you feel that, you feel that there are still fears of going back to the earlier position? Well, we are still in that position. I mean, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, the clerk has made this move, but we are still in that position. Apartheid is still in place, and uh, the majority of the people have no votes. Another question, yes, one more question that I want to ask for you, Mr. Commander, is that there's, there are two positions now. One is the drafting of a constitution, and another is the setting up a, of a government which will draft a constitution on a popular mandate. Setting up of a government first and then the drafting of a constitution on the basis of a popular mandate. Now, in your opinion, which should come first, the constitution or the setting up of an interim government? Well, uh, it makes no difference what actually happened. Is we are not concerned with formalities. We are uh, concerned with substantial changes and developments. The position is this, that uh, the government <coughs> at the present moment is both the player, is both a party, and uh, a referee, that's a very unsatisfactory situation. And uh, we have made a very solemn agreements. We have, for example, agreed on a definition of a political prisoner. And we say a political prisoner is a person who is convicted of an offense which was politically motivated. No matter what the crime is, it may be murder, it may be treason, it may be sedition, uh, it may be theft. As long as it was politically motivated, the person who committed it is a political offender. Uh, that is what we agreed upon. The government then subsequently sought to change that definition. And uh, it has done this on numerous occasions. We say it is doing this because it is both a party as well as a judge. And uh, we want to, to, to end that. And that is why, therefore, we want an independent body to supervise the process of transformation. And uh, that can only be done by an interim government. And uh, a constituent assembly is something which is going to require a great deal of planning. Because uh, we wanted to go to the masses of the people. They must participate in deciding who should draw up a new constitution. And uh, that, of course, is going to be an involved process. And, uh, but that involved process itself must be supervised by an independent body. It is therefore vitally important for us in the IFP that it is recognized that present levels of violence in South Africa are prohibitively high. Violence must be reduced for negotiations to have any chance of success. Violence will not end while the war talk goes on and while there is a constant drive for the kind of goals that can only be achieved in all or nothing tactics and strategies, in winner takes all political battles. South Africa is a, is a deeply polarized society, as I'm sure you've realized in the, in the few days you've been here. And the demand for winner takes all politics can only further polarize our country. And that is why in the IFP we find that we have to oppose the ANC author Harari declaration, which demands the establishment of the Constituent Assembly, which will lead to an interim government to which the sovereign government will have to be prepared to hand over power. The world must understand that that just will not happen in South Africa because it just cannot happen. And I'm not only talking about whites when I say that South Africans do not want to live into a kind of consistent darkness. We want to know where we are going, Mr. Griffiths and gentlemen, and we want to have assurance that we can in fact get there. I'd like to ask you a question. Are you in favor of the principle of one person, one vote? Is your party in favor of the principle of one person, yeah. one vote? Yes each in his own political community. In other words, <coughs> my Zulu friends can elect their Zulu government in Zululand. The Tswanas <coughs> of Maputa Tswana have already a state with a president and a government and a political community which is one of the most peaceful spots at the moment in South Africa. 
And I challenge you to go and challenge those people and tell them that they are, let's say for instance, uh, uh, puppets of the South African government. Go and tell that to President uh, uh, Mangope in his face. They feel that the ANC is being influenced by the communists and they are afraid that if the ANC comes to power, it will be actually the communists taking power. How true is that? Well, uh, the question here is one of the functioning of the <coughs> democratic process. If uh, you believe in democracy, then you believe in democracy and uh, you must accept its result. There must be a democratic process, there must be a democratic result. And once those conditions have been fulfilled, if you are a democrat, you will accept them. The parliaments in Europe work on this basis because there the Communist Party can compete and they actually can return members to parliament. And in Europe, there are many communists in their parliament. The African National Congress is a parliament of the African people. And uh, uh, in the 40s, for example, <coughs> people like uh, Comrade <coughs> Tambo, Mr. Sisolo, and others uh, moved a resolution to expel the communists from the ANC. They were humiliated <laughs> by people who are actually anti communist, <coughs> members of the ANC who are anti communist, because they said, This is our parliament. Just as Britain, France, and Germany have parliaments with communists. We also subscribe to the same idea here. Now, uh, we also refer to the case where the Western powers, uh, the capitalist countries, had to work with the Soviet Union when they had a common problem, like the last World War. There was this grand alliance between the United States, Britain, and France, and the Soviet Union. Nobody can say that that alliance was wrong. And uh, whatever the gains of the Soviet Union that were made as a result of that alliance, we are working on exactly the same principle. We don't think we as the ANC can be controlled by anybody, and uh, not the government, not the Communist Party. We know what we want. And uh, if they support what we want, we'll work with them. If they oppose what we want, we'll tell them. And uh, that uh, here, uh, we can't accept what they say. But if they bring something which we feel is in the interest of the movement, if by accepting their views, a stronger ANC will emerge, we'll accept it. Now, black South Africans as well as white South Africans are very much aware of the extent which the political victories in the rest of Africa and other parts of the third world are not always led to the government which benefits the people in every case. They have learned that revolutionary organization after a revolutionary organization which formed government after government introduced harsh, all demanding political power structures which pushed the people into situations which were frequently totally intolerable. Political victories against a racist government or an oppressive government all on their own is just not sufficient. People demand victories which will be followed by rising standards of living for the poorest of the poor. Whatever political victories have not produced this dividend for the oppressed and the poor, the victors who have ousted colonial racist or oppressive governments in turn become victims of forces which arise out of the dissatisfaction of the people in seeing the, that their plight is not improved in any way. It is my plea to Commonwealth countries, therefore, to recognize that this is the reality of the situation we face. If we in South Africa do not produce a democracy after apartheid in which the ordinary people actually benefit in terms of increased standards of living, then the democracy we attempt to establish will fail. It's as simple as that. For politics to be followed by economic development and sustained growth of the magnitude that will enable a government after apartheid to roll back the frontiers of poverty, we must establish a national will to make democracy work and to develop the kind of society which can generate the kind of wealth that will be needed. I think, I say that South Africa is big enough, and we have it, as I said, I can't com complete all these points. Yeah. We are not a community of Africans. We are a community of Zulus, and Afrikaners, and, and Indians, and Colors, and Vendors, 
shanggans and zongs, each with our own identity. And I can I say, one man, one vote in his own community. And then we can come along and we can form a depoliticized Southern African economic community where we can deal with these matters. You see, Mr. Mandela, <coughs> they've got the African National Congress. I, I say the African National Congress is actually a causa imperialist congress. That's what <laughs> yeah. they are. That's what they are, you know. Yeah. Negotiation means we'll have to make compromises from all sides. But we also believe that uh, that we need <coughs> also to uh, to ensure that even in the executive we won't have a winner take all situation. And there we are looking at uh, <coughs> not specifically as it is and as it is working there, but at the principles of the Swiss model. From our side now, I'm giving you now the National Party's point. Mm. Uh, where all the main role players form part of the executive, so as to ensure cooperation, and uh, uh, where the basis of decision making is consensus. And uh, we therefore think that one of the options we must look at is an executive in which the main role players are represented, a sort of an enforced coalition, if I can put it that way. Uh, but it is a tremendously uh, exciting uh, phase in which we find ourselves. Uh, we are in a hurry to get the multi-party conference going. You must have seen the press yesterday. You know, they had to switch off. Oh. Uh, because uh, there is a report about uh, a well known uh, criminal mm. who has killed no less than 100 people uh, this year. Murdered 100 people this year. No action on the part of the And uh, I spoke to declare that you know, during the uh, conference of the ANC, <coughs> and uh, because what was happening was that uh, the houses, the families of the delegates uh, to the ANC had been harassed in various uh, areas, and I spoke to him about this matter. And amongst others, I drew attention to the activities of this criminal, uh, and uh, well. The government was able to post some policemen <coughs> in just one area in Ferrano here, in the houses of delegates to the conference. There are about ten of them. But in the rest of the country, in areas of fact, they didn't do that. And uh, I mentioned the name of this fellow, who is a terror in the district of Ferrano, where we have had a lot of trouble. He has killed no less than 100, according to the press. And uh, no action has been taken against him. Um, I heard this morning uh, over the radio, but uh, I came late, please. I heard over the radio that somebody has at last been arrested, but I don't know who it is, whether it is the same chair or somebody else. Did you listen to this? Uh, as I was coming in, but uh, it was late, you know, the tail end, it may be this, the chair. But uh, the pattern to us, what is happening, because we have been hammering uh, the Inkata together with the state security services. The tactic that is being used now is uh, to use well-known criminals to conduct uh, these attacks on ANC supporters. <coughs> So both the government and, uh, and the guard are operating, you know, from behind the scenes. It's uh, criminals, pure criminals, who are now killing our people one by one. Uh, in Cape Town, a very prominent uh, member of the ANC who was in Robben Island with us, who was gunned down about uh, three weeks ago, I think. And then another one, very prominent, whose wife was gunned down about two months, was also gunned down about a week ago. Another family, uh, also the husband, uh, was uh, attending 
uh, conference of the ANC, this latest conference in Durban. His wife was gunned down, his uh, daughter and son-in-law. And uh, no arrests have been made. And uh, that is one of the things that is striking. No arrest. They find it very difficult to trace uh, uh, these criminals. And uh, you hardly find a single case where an attack has been made <coughs> on the members of Inglaterra. And the government does not act. They act immediately and they are able to trace uh, the criminal. Because some of our people against our instructions are retaliating and they are immediately nerfed. Not so with members of the country. Then uh, they have opened fire on our people a couple of times, uh, on, on, on numerous occasions. You don't know a single case in which they have ever opened fire against a demonstration by a country. So from that you will be able to, aware what, to know what is happening. And we are saying that when we consider <coughs> the uh, improvements, which the reforms which have been brought about by Declan, you must consider that in the light of what the Declan government is doing, they are deeply involved in this violence. And uh, it is something that may actually derail the peace process. As I say, we will try. We are trying to keep the peace process in course. But you must be under no doubt whatsoever that uh, Mr. De Klerk, I do find it difficult to put an end to the violence. All the state security services are doing what De Klerk wants. There's a tendency in some circles to shift the goalposts and to say, but now you've addressed all, most, all the, or most of all, uh, the most important stumbling blocks which have been identified previously, the release of political prisoners, etc., etc. But now some new ones are added. And uh, the one which you will also hear about is violence must first come to it. As if, and we are accused, as if the government is the instigator of the violence. The truth is that we've had a violent uh, and a volatile situation for many years now. But the character of the violence have changed. It used to be aimed at overthrowing the government which was seen to be a suppressive government, a minority government dominating majorities, having banned certain political organizations, having made infringements on the freedom of speech and the right to organize and present your case. Because we've changed all that, there is now a normal political process, all bans have been lifted, there is freedom of speech, <coughs> protest within the law is allowed, marches take place, rallies take place, there are no limitations on political organizations to organize and to canvas support and to present their case with an eye the future. If Mr. De Klerk is in a hurry, he would be in a hurry first about removing the obstacles to negotiation. Yeah. Because we have made it clear that uh, and the Harare Declaration, as well, uh, which has been supported by the OAU, uh, by the Non-Aligned Movement, and by the United Nations Declaration, uh, these obstacles must be removed before we can sit down to negotiate. If he's in a hurry, he would then remove those obstacles. He has not done so. And uh, we still have a large number of political prisoners in prison. We still have political trials going on in this country. Apartheid is still in place. And uh, it's not what he says, it's what he does uh, that is uh, decisive. He hasn't done that. Secondly, on the question of violence, the state security forces are undoubtedly involved. What De Klerk wants, he does want to negotiate and he does want to bring about fundamental changes in the country. But he doesn't want uh, to happen in this country what happened in Namibia, where one political organization was able to take over power. Uh, so he wants a, a weakened ANC which cannot on its own take over power. 
That is the problem of Mr. Tiglak. And uh, what he says, that he is in a hurry, uh, he is in a hurry uh, to weaken the ANC, uh, not in a hurry to bring about a peaceful solution in this country. And I can assure you that we have had the two leading summits uh, between the ANC and the government. And the initiative to have those summits meet comes from the ANC. We have had to persuade them and uh, their reluctance uh, uh, about the process is very clear right through because we spent uh, four years from 1986 working behind the scenes trying to convince the government that the correct thing to do for the country is for us to sit down and talk. It took us four years before we could succeed. And even when we are now able to drag the government uh, to the negotiating, to the discussion, they have been very reluctant. And that reluctance is demonstrated by the fact that up to now, we still have the obstacles which have not been addressed. If the clerk wants to say he would have released all the political prisoners, he has not done so. He would have put an end to the violence. He has not done so. We can't continue to negotiate when the government is killing our people. We have called on the violence issue uh, uh, a conference which at that stage the ANC and related organizations too it chose to not to accept. It was nonetheless a very successful conference. From that we appointed a continuation committee and uh, we accepted the concept there of uh, a small facilitating committee. Uh, basically of non-political uh, leaders, such as a few church leaders, a few business leaders. They immediately started working, and on the 22nd of June, we had a fully representative <coughs> of about 50 or so people, or <coughs> was it 80 people, who, uh, who fundamentally discussed the issues. They have now agreed to form five working groups, which is fully representative of all the main role players. They've identified an agenda falling out in five specific headings, and they're meeting this week. So there are good developments uh, in, <coughs> in this regard as well. What process do you feel is the process that will bring about that new constitution quickly and effectively so that your people can get one person, one vote. What method do you We have, have uh, announced uh, on the 8th of January uh, our intention <coughs> to call on all party congress of all political organizations in this country which have got proven support, whether inside or outside parliament, because we feel that uh, in that congress <coughs> we would then have a platform for exchanging views <coughs> and, uh, on how to proceed forward, the way forward, how to prepare for a new constitution. And uh, we also have made it very clear that uh, uh, we believe in a democratic constitution. The IFP believes that now is the time for us to begin negotiations. We believe that now is the time for an all-party conference. Now is the time we believe that all parties, political parties, however advantage or disadvantage they may be, to come together to see what can in fact be done. Even now, while blacks still do not have the vote, and even now, while poverty still remains supreme, and even now, while violence is prohibitively high, we need to come together now to do what can be done now, because if we do not begin now, despite the difficulties which surround us, we will just not succeed. I firmly stand on the point of view that the process is irreversible. We can not turn back. You must decide for yourself whether you also accept my and my government's bona fides. If you accept, then there is an open door. There is no longer any reason to kick the door down. <coughs> there is no longer a wall which has to be broken down. There is no need for force. There is no need for continued pressure. Pressure, I believe, has never been 
but there maybe you will differ from. It has never been constructed. Because pressure has resulted in hardening of attitudes. It has resulted in South Africa becoming less dependent of the international